On March 3rd, 2017, Nintendo was finally releasing The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild on Wii U in the new Switch console. The game was announced over four years ago and has suffered numerous delays, but as it's always been with Zelda games, good things are worth waiting for. Over the last few years, many comparisons have been made between the new game and the original Legend of Zelda. Let's take a look at the 1986 masterpiece and talk about what we can expect from what will surely be an instant classic, Breath of the Wild. Let's take a close look at the original before we dissect the link between that and Breath of the Wild. Development on Zelda began in 1984 and was headed by Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka. Miyamoto was famously influenced by childhood experiences in the development of Zelda. As a boy growing up near Kyoto, he loved to explore outdoors and discover new places. He wanted to capture that sense of exploration in Zelda. The title of Zelda was named after Zelda Fitzgerald wife to the famous novelist and Minnesota native Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald. An interesting link between the game and my home state Minnesota, although Zelda Fitzgerald herself was from Alabama. Zelda was designed to be a launch title for the Famicom Disk System, which would thus of course be on disk medium, enabling rewritable content in this case, allowing users to save and reload game data. Zelda indeed did launch alongside the Famicom Disk System on February 21st, 1986 on a whopping 128 kilobyte disk. It was a hit and inspired a sequel to be released in Japan 11 months later, but even with Zelda 2 out in Japan, Nintendo was still slow to bring the game to other regions. Despite Zelda's success, the disk system didn't make it overseas, which raised a problem. How would players save their progress without the use of rewritable disks? The answer came in the form of a circuit called the Memory Management Controller Chip, which allowed for battery-powered RAM, which can be used to save game data for the first time in a cartridge format. Finally, North America got Zelda on August 22, 1987, and PAL regions on November 15, 1987. One of the coolest features of these new versions is that the cartridge is frickin' gold! To show this off, Nintendo went as far as to put a square hole in the game's box. There were a few small differences between the Famicom and NES versions of Zelda. One worth mentioning is the Famicom's built-in microphone on the system's controller. Certain enemies could be defeated when it detected sound, but this didn't work on the NES, of course. It would be re-released on the standard grey cartridges, and on July 9, 1994, the game was re-released in Japan on cartridge format for the first time on the Famicom. It was a commercial success, and the NES and Famicom versions alone have sold over 6.5 million units worldwide. No doubt due to its sweet-ass U.S. commercials, including the smash hit Zelda rap. Yeah, go Link, yeah, get Zelda. Awesome! Intense! The Nintendo Entertainment System. Your parents help you hook it up. The original Zelda has been re-released numerous times since then, so it's easy to get a hold of. Versions include the GameCube Collector's Edition in 2003, GBA port in 2004, Wii, Wii U, and 3DS Virtual Consoles, the NES Classic Edition Mini, and it's even available on Animal Crossing on GameCube, but you'll have to hack it out of the code since Nintendo never got around to making it available. Most interestingly though, and possibly least known, was the 1995 Super NES remake of Zelda. The game was only available in Japan and is known as BS Zelda. Hardy har no, not bullshit Zelda. Broadcast Satellite Zelda. And what the hell is that, you surely ask? Well, only in Japan, as usual. An add-on called the Satellaview was released for the Super Famicom, which allowed players to download games via satellite during specific broadcast times and often featured live voice actors. Four Zelda games were released for it, including two 16-bit remakes of the original with new maps often referred to as the third and fourth quests. Rather than Link as the hero, they have generic player avatars. Why Nintendo has never released these in a normal medium is beyond me. Personally, the thought of playing these on official Nintendo hardware makes me have funny feelings inside and I would jump at the opportunity. And chances are that they're great if they're anything like the first two quests where the player, as Link, explores the land of Hyrule and search for fragments of the Triforce of Wisdom that Zelda has hidden to prevent Ganon and his army from possessing it. Only when Link discovers eight labyrinths, solves their riddles, defeats their guardians, 
and recovers the Triforce Fragments will he gain access to and be powerful enough to face Ganon. If he is victorious, Link will recover the Triforce of Power which Ganon had stolen, save Zelda, and return peace to Hyrule. So what can you say about The Legend of Zelda that hasn't been said already? Frankly, not a whole lot. I'm going to do a quick review of the game and talk about it and hopefully be able to offer you some new perspectives. I want to mention the music quickly as a fun 8-bit soundtrack by Koji Kondo. The view of the action is top-down and divided by sections. Each of these sections is one screen and when you reach the edge or go through a door it will move you into the next section. If you've played other traditional style Zelda games, you'll be able to see that this is where that tradition started. The game's structure of progression by finding a level and gaining an item or power used to defeat the boss and find the next level has been the foundation of the series and been cloned countless times since. It has some items that have become series mainstays such as the bow and boomerang as well as items we never saw again, such as the ladder which is used to stretch over water and make a bridge. This game is quite difficult and will test your skill and patience if you've never played it before. Be prepared that it's not going to hold your hand or really even direct you. Unless you are really prepared to exhaust every option and spend a ton of time not knowing what the hell you're doing, you'll want to look up a walkthrough or at least a map such as those in the NES Game Atlas published by Nintendo Power, which are high quality and still leave you with the puzzles to solve. The Atlas also explains why on Earth one of the temples is shaped like a swastika. Enemies also come in many shapes and sizes and range from pushovers that help you get used to the controls to hard as nails dungeon baddies. Take for example the Iron Knuckles. They swarm you and kick your ass. Maybe Katie can help us out with a few pointers. Hey guys, so Zelda is a pretty hard game, especially for Mark. So I'm gonna give you some tips that'll help make your adventure more bearable. First, one that everybody knows. After you beat Ganon the first time, you'll unlock a second version of the game to play through with new maps and more difficult temples. However, there is an easy way to access the second quest without beating Ganon. On the File Select screen, you'll need an empty file. Choose Register Your Name and use Zelda as a file name. Select this file and you'll automatically start on the second quest. Some enemies, like Iron Knuckles, can kick your butt if you're not careful, especially in groups. Try attacking them from around a corner before they can turn towards you. Even better, if you're on the bottom side of blocks, your sword will reach through to hit enemies on the opposite side while keeping you safely out of harm's way. But remember, this only works from the bottom. One inconvenient thing about this game is that you can only save when you get game over. Well, that's not entirely true. First, press start to enter the inventory screen. Now plug a controller into the second slot of your NES. Press and hold A on controller 2, then press any direction on the D-pad. This will activate the save screen without having to go through a game over. Those are just a couple tricks in Zelda, but don't worry, there's still lots of secrets to discover. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got a swordless three heart run to get back to. Thank you, Katie. Personally, I love this game as I do with almost every Legend of Zelda title. I love seeing where so many aspects of Zelda today got their start and there is something very satisfying to me every time I play this game. If I start a new file, I almost always fall through to the end. A huge contributor to that enjoyment comes in the game's play control. It's tight, accurate, and responsive and gives you a real sense of accomplishment every time you beat a difficult enemy. So who would I recommend The Legend of Zelda for? First of all, if you consider yourself to be a true Zelda fan, playing through this is a must to prove your worth. If you don't happen to be a huge Zelda fan, but you have played this before, you'll find it's really easy to come back to. But if you're new to it, you're probably going to have a really hard time. Since the game is so easily available now, casual fans of the series and of Nintendo and video game history should at least check it out and play through the first few dungeons to see what it's all about. And despite its archaic nature, the quality in the series titles today can be seen in the original. I have no doubt that quality will carry over into Breath of the Wild, the newest series entry. Nintendo has made it clear from early on that this new title is going to be heavily influenced by the original Zelda. I started to get suspicious when Nintendo released this image. Compare it to this artwork from the original Zelda and the similarity is apparent. At first, I dismissed it as a tribute by the artist, but more connections kept coming. A lot of videos online have pointed out other similarities between the overworlds for these games, but I won't get too into that here. 
Perhaps the Plateau and Breath of the Wild is the same as the Hyrule map we enjoyed on the NES. Nintendo said with Breath of the Wild they're hoping to rediscover the pleasure of exploring a discovery for players that they accomplished with NES Zelda, which was instantly recognized for its non-linear and open gameplay. Zelda set the standard for open worlds at the time, but the series has since lost touch with that aspect. Breath of the Wild is said to be setting that standard all over again. You were somewhat able to choose the order you played temples in NES Zelda, and they didn't really have themes specifically and could be found anywhere. Breath of the Wild's progression will be much the same. Nintendo has said that the original Legend of Zelda was initially going to have a more science fiction theme to it that included technological elements, electronic circuitry aspects, and time travel. Take a look at these shots from Breath of the Wild. Does this explain all the orange and blue circuit looking content and connect the games? A trailer released by Nintendo has a voiceover of someone apparently telling Link that Link doesn't seem to have any recollection of him and is ready to hear what happened 100 years ago. The split timeline comes into play here as well. Elements from every possible source have been dissected to fit Breath of the Wild into a certain part of it such as the involvement of different Hylian tribes and Ganon. And trust me, I have barely scratched the surface. All of these connections could mean any number of things, and chances are that they're just random influences that the developers took from past titles, but I think that there's more to it than that. Warning that this could turn out to be a spoiler, but I think the connection to the original Zelda is too strong. Even if some evidence points in other directions, I believe that Breath of the Wild is going to take place in the defeated hero timeline after Zelda and Zelda 2. Further, and call me crazy for this, I suspect that Link will be the very same person from those two titles and not a descendant, making this his first actual return since those titles were released in the 1980s. After Link prevented the resurrection of Ganon in Zelda 2, he was frozen in time in case a threat to resurrect the Prince of Darkness should ever return. 100 years later and it's happened, Hyrule is in ruins and the only hero worthy and courageous enough to face Ganon again is Link. It's important to realize though that this is only a theory, but we'll find out for sure tomorrow when Breath of the Wild is released. My expectations for this game are absolutely through the roof and I cannot wait to play it. Please let me know in the comments what you think of these games, this video, and what you would like to see on Keller Creative Games in the future. Also, I would love to hear what you think the connections are between the original NES Zelda and Breath of the Wild. I hope you enjoyed and thank you for watching.